<coughs> we're going to talk about uh, Armour's Five Orders of Ignorance, though I actually slipped the deadline on that. You don't have to have this read until the start of class next week. <coughs> what we're going to talk about now because it's a good lead into the chapters we're going to talk in Brooks. And then uh, three more chapters in Brooks. We'll do that, and then I will give the rest of the class period, I'll answer any questions any of you have, but then I'll give the rest of the class period to team meeting. Uh, since you all need to start on your org charts and get those done by Saturday. So, any other questions before we get started? If not, I'm a little embarrassed to acknowledge that I've owned uh, The Laws of Software Process by Philip Armour for quite a few years and had never read this appendix until I taught this class winter semester. Uh, and it's not because I, I don't have a lot of books that I haven't read that I own but because it is, in my opinion, such an important appendix, and I see why uh, Chuck, Dr. Knudsen, uh, had it as required reading year after year in his class, because it, it, it provides a conceptual framework for the process of software development that explains a lot of the core problems or issues that you run into. His first assertion, and I'm just going to, I'll just go through, this is all taken straight out of this stuff, is that software is not a product, it is a knowledge storage medium. When you're writing software, you're basically gathering knowledge and embodying it in something that will then act on that knowledge. Now this may seem obvious, except that the process of gathering that knowledge is an imperfect process and often a very inefficient process. It's, and it, this is what the five orders of ignorance is about, namely that <clears throat> if you're, I, I think I said this last week, you know, if I've written a sort routine and I'm gonna write the same sort routine, then I'm probably gonna write a perfect sort routine, or perfect as far as the same thing, because I already know how to do it. But I've already done that, so what's the value? The value in software development generally lies with the novelty. You are doing something that either hasn't been done before or you're doing it in a new and different way or you're trying to displace an existing technology and so on. And that novelty means there's things you don't know yet that you're going to have to solve. And this is where the inefficiency comes in and it's unescapable. And the problem, and this is what Brooks talks about when we get to Brooks' chapters, is that because of that unavoidable nature of discovery, software estimation is extremely difficult because you don't know what problems you're gonna run into. Uh, and uh, it's, so <clears throat> we have this, we, you know, the, the process of software development, and, and, and I'm sure most of you have experienced this, is there's stuff you know how to do, and you start doing it, and you run across a problem and say, oh, that's interesting. And you try this, and you try this, and you try this, and you finally come up with a solution. But you've had three tries there. You've spent time, you've spent intellectual effort, and so on. You've learned things which are not part of the final solution, but it was part of the process you went through. Doing Sundog, I had this nifty idea. Sundog was a real-time science fiction adventure game, you're an interstellar trader, you know, you're buying and selling stuff, you're, you're fighting or dodging pirates while you're traveling from planet to planet, so on and so forth. And at one point, relatively early on, I had this, this great idea for a particular uh, type of display, you know, this, things were going to work a certain way, and, you know, we are going to put this up on the screen and do this, and you know, this was going to represent this and so on. And I probably spent a good two or three weeks writing the code and getting that to work. And so I got it to work, prototyped it, plugged it in with some data, started doing it, looked at it and said, no, that sucks. And threw it away. <laughs> uh, it, it seemed great in my mind. It seemed like a solution for a particular aspect of the game design. But when, once I got it up on the screen, it's kind of like, no, that just really doesn't work. Uh, one of the great things I regret about Sundog is that, because this was all done on floppy disks on, you know, Apple II and so on, 
I wish I had saved more source code. Uh, my original graphics engine was, was a full-blown windowing system. It has pop-up windows that pop up and vanish and so on and so forth. It's inspired by the Lisa. We were, we were just a few months away from shipping Sundog when, when the Macintosh came out. So it was mostly stuff we'd seen on Lisa, which of course came from Xerox Park and so on and so forth. But the problem was is that we were targeting originally for a 48K Mac, or I, excuse me, Apple. I finally convinced Wayne to go for a 64K as a base, base configuration. So I had written this, this graphics library that, that had a lot of functionality in it, and then I had to start throwing portions of it away because I did not have enough space on the disk for in memory uh, for it to be there. Uh, and in, in retrospect, I wish I had just kept setting floppy disks aside with different versions of it, uh, which is something else. Now, let me ask you this. In your experience, whether this be your private projects, your internships, projects here, what has been your experience with the discovery process in software development? Thoughts? Yeah, Matthew. Uh, my primary experience has been that, I mean, kind of like, I mean, your experience with the window, you have to do something to discover that you're wrong. <laughs> um, it's like, I remember, uh, actually just, um, I was doing voxels for a while on a personal project, and I mean, I had a working solution, but it had horrible fundamental flaws in it that made it <laughs> unusable. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I had to work it out the first time yep. so that the next version would be able to deal with those fundamental flaws. I didn't know those would exist until until you did. Until you did. Other other observations. Yeah. Uh, if you can document it, then you can keep a lot of people from having to reinvent the same wheel. Because um, I mean, most of us see something, a lot of us are going to try and do it the same way. And you know, if once here's the way it goes: once you do something wrong, you go on Stack Overflow and you see that like 50 other people have done it the exact same wrong way. <laughs> And then there's a right way. And so yes. if you can keep track of it, um, it kind of helps everyone else avoid making that same mistake the first time through. Yep. Which is, by the way, one of the reasons, we touched on this, I think, last week, why personnel uh, turnover can be so devastating. Because you lose people who have done things the wrong way, and they know what not to try. And you hire someone new on, and they go through and basically go through the same learning process all over again and make the same mistakes. And sometimes they don't learn as quickly. Other thoughts, any? Yes. Well, one Rick. thing I've learned, I've worked at BYU Archaeology doing app development there, so there's a huge gap because they've been you know, using paper and, yeah. and so, oh, yeah. so long. Um, and so I've noticed that like these type of discoveries don't only come from like your coding, but they can also come from what the users think they want. Like that's a huge one where you like make it exactly how they said and then you show it to them and they're like, this won't work and they're like, okay, you know. It's like the user needs to find out for themselves sometimes what doesn't work, which is very frustrating, but it's that's, part of the process. That is a fundamental issue and we'll talk about that later in the semester, but uh, the, uh, uh, it is a truism within, particularly within when you're doing software development for someone else, that the user doesn't know what they want until you put something on the screen. And they say, I don't like that. <laughs> or as uh, Meyer and Repton, uh, the Art of Systems Architecting, a book I highly, highly recommend you add to your library. Uh, they have a whole chapter, for Northern, they had a whole appendix that are maxims in, in systems development. And uh, one of them is, I hated his feedback. Uh, and it is. Uh, other, other experiences, observations when you've been through this? It's like, no, no, move on, move on. Okay, I'll move on. Okay. What can happen along the way? The problem of late discovery. Uh, oh, man, this is, this is a real problem where you get, the, the, as, as we talked about some last week, there is a temptation to go for all the low-hanging fruit. You've got great prototype tools, and you've got some engines you can plug in, you can do this, and it's like, man, look at this. We've got, we've got an app running, and it's doing this, and it's doing this, and it's doing this. And you've done all the easy stuff, and you get uh, a long ways away, and suddenly you run into a hard problem. And you realize, as we talked about last week, this blind alley, you've gone down a blind alley, and you've got to back up, and you've got to 
back up a lot. And it's really hard to explain the management why you have to back up. Trust me. It's like, okay, we, we tried this solution and we've just reached an inherent limit. We cannot get the throughput. You know, we're, we're, we're using a particular third party software or we're doing this particular algorithm and we've discovered that it will not scale to what we need. We have to have a different solution. Uh, projects, those are icebergs that projects hit all the time. Uh, one of the things you'll be doing in reading one of my articles is do not defer the difficult in IT projects. And this is such a temptation. Because you want to be making progress, you want to be reporting progress. It makes you feel good about yourself. It's hard to tackle the hard stuff right up front. Uh, and as per, I think, comments that both of you made, both Matthew and uh, Paul, knowing what doesn't work can be as valuable as knowing what does work. You know, you go in and do something, it's kind of like, oh, this doesn't work, this doesn't, this, this is the classic Thomas Edison quote. You know, I, I now know 10,000 things that won't act as a filament for an incandescent bulb. Uh, and the problem is, is the knowledge of what doesn't work is often discarded. And when people come back later, either because of turnover or because something has gone into maintenance, they look at it and say, well, gee, they didn't do this. This would have been real easy. Let's go do this. And they go diving down a rabbit hole and discover for themselves why it doesn't work. I like this idea of corrupted knowledge. Uh, this, this, this also reflects what's commonly called technical debt, which is often your shipping code has bad stuff in it that are artifacts of approaches you took either just to get it out the door or because you didn't have time to go back and clean stuff up. <laughs> yeah. This is actually a, kind of a funny problem I'm running into right now in my workplace. And, and so I wanted to share. Where it's, I mean, it, it's those things as well, but I mean, if I'm trying to maintain code and just change a little bit of parts, these little segments here and there, it's hard to know which parts are actually important. <laughs> And which parts are, you know, leftovers from something else? Yeah. You know, what order matters? Yep. And so it's a. Uh, it's it's it, this this is a this is a real issue. Uh, you you know if you're dealing with uh, code that is in production, code that's shipping or whatever, uh, and and Brooks is going to talk about this uh, a little later on uh, when we cover his chapters. You reach a situation where it's kind of like. Okay, what can I change? Uh, is this actually an important part, and is it a good important part or a bad important part? Uh, and this is why you often get situations you have uh, software rot, software entropy. Where as time goes on, the software that's in production becomes less stable and less reliable because it has been patched and modified and chained just to force some particular feature in. Uh, and it's like, you know, playing, my, my grandkids play Jenga Bomb where they're trying to pull pieces out of the stack before the whole thing blows up. Uh, you'll find some maintenance coding is like that. Other, anyone with other, any other observations or experience on this, things you've seen this as in your own projects or as an intern or whatever. Okay, what the discovery process looks like, and this is, I've thought about this for years. Uh, <clears throat> back when I was in high school, the summer that men landed on the moon, case okay, so showing my age again, for the first time, my good friend Alan Scribner decided that we were going to climb, it's in San Diego County, East San Diego County, there's a big mountain escarpment that's called El Capitan, no relation to El Capitan in Yosemite, but and we decided we are going to climb up to the top there and plant a flag and a plaque and so on just because I don't like to do weird things like that. Uh, and there's a group of about half a dozen of us. And, and, and this was sort of the process. You know, you can see this escarpment miles away. And it's like, well, no problem. We'll go and we'll park at the base and we'll just hike up to the top. And we got lost hiking up to the top because what you had going up the slope were manzanita bushes. Who knows what manzanita bushes are like? None of you? Have you ever seen manzanita wood? It tends to have these two colors of wood and be very twisty and gnarly. 
Well, that's what the bushes are made of. It's this very hard wood and very spiky leaves, and it's almost impossible to push through a, a tightly packed clump of manzanita bushes. And we kept taking different routes and going different routes, and we ended up somewhere near the top and had to someone send someone down the other side who had to catch a ride and go around and get our car and bring it back to the other side, and we all hiked down that way. Uh, that's a great metaphor for software projects, okay? <laughs> you think you know where you're going, you get started, and you're going to start, you're going to get deep into the woods, deep into the manzanita brush. And you're going to find roadblocks, and you take paths, and you try to work around it, and it gets worse and worse. Uh, oops. Wrong way. Now this is his mapping of the time spent finding knowledge. The solid lines are actually useful knowledge applied to the solution. The dotted lines are the things that you learned that you didn't use. Stuff that doesn't work. You know, you go down the path, it's kind of like, okay, this is going to work right after backup. And so what you have is by the time you get to the end of the project, you not only have this, this jagged solid line which shows that it wasn't a clear straight path to a working solution, but you also have all the time spent on these subpaths that ended up being dead ends. This is why software estimation is so hard because you don't know ahead of time how much time you're going to spend on each of those paths. And again, we tend to think, we tend to see it as Oh, it's going to be a straight line from here to here. Now, if we took the actual distance of this line <laughs> and compared it to a straight line between those two points, we're probably looking at double the amount of time. That's what happens on software development. You have all these little side steps, all the little things that you go through. So he talks about his five orders of ignorance. He says, I'm an engineer. I start counting from zero. That's what engineers do. Zeroth order is a lack of ignorance. I know something, I know that I know it, I can demonstrate that I know it. You know, I can write a bubble sort. Uh, first order is that I don't know something, and I know that I don't know something. Uh, what's the best way to sort an almost sorted list? I don't know off the top of my head. I know there are sort algorithms that are best for that. But I also have half a dozen books at home that I could pop open and look at, you know starting with canoe searching and sorting and uh, say okay this is this is how to do it uh, this is this is why I have bookcases at home filled with texts uh, second order lack of awareness I don't know something and I don't know that I don't know it this is like you know launching into a project and saying oh yeah I can do this I can do this and there are lurking pits there that I have no clue are there and I'm going to you know, have what is probably going to be a painful education in saying, oh, I had no idea that I was going to have to worry about this. Uh, the third order is a lack of process, which is I have no way of discovering that I don't know something, that I don't know that I don't know something. <laughs> this, this, is, this is sort of the I, I don't know and I don't avail myself resources, I mean, you know, Google and, and Stack Overflow are absolutely wonderful. Google's probably half my brain. Uh, and, uh, and I say that as someone who, who like I said, I have, I have a lot of books. Uh, but there, there are people, we're going to talk probably next week about the role of quality of people in software engineering. But I will tell, I will tell this Story now. When I was an undergrad here, I took uh, 404. It's actually, one of my favorite classes. Being taught by Tad Norman, who at that time it was the former head of the department, uh, and by, and I can't remember his name, he was basically an adjunct professor who was taking a year's sabbatical from working in the industry. So, someone, someone a lot like me, not, not as old as I am now, but you know, someone who had a lot of years out there and just was back and saying, yeah, I'm going to help teach this class. Uh, and and this, this adjunct professor said something which startled me, uh, and that I found was, was exactly right. He said, if you knew which ones to select, 
He said you could take half of all the people out in industry working in data processing, which pretty much called the IT industry back then. You'd take them out and shoot them, and not only would no deadlines be missed, but a lot of them would be advanced. <laughs> uh, and I graduated not long after that and started work at General Dynamics, and I said, my gosh, he was right. Uh, one of the first pieces of code I had to look at and do something with was about a hundred line routine written in Fortran that had 20 go-to jumps in it. And I looked at this and thought, what, what, is this, what did this person do? Does this person even understand what they're trying to do? Uh, and <clears throat> one of the themes that we'll hit upon on, out there is that there is such demand for IT workers. I know it won't feel like it at times when you're job hunting or between jobs, but there is such demand at IT workers that it acts as a giant vacuum and sucks a lot of people into IT who frankly don't have the skills or education uh, or talent to be there. And so, and usually the, the HR managers can't distinguish. So you get a lot of people hired and you know you have you'll, you'll walk into an IT organization, you'll quickly say, here are half a dozen people who are really sharp on their game, know what they're doing, and here's another half dozen who you basically are running around putting up fires behind them. Uh, go go read uh, uh, WTF.com. Uh, you'll get the stories there for, from all those things. And the fifth is you don't know about the five orders of ignorance. You all do, so you know you're all, actually, you're all, <laughs> you all are, are, are no longer subject to third or fourth. You know what that, all that is. And, uh, but you're going to deal with the first, the zero first and second through your career. So apply to software development. Zero third or I know how to complete the system. I know exactly what needs to be done. No surprises. First order, I know what I need to know what I need to figure out to complete the system. I have to make this work, I have to make this work, I have to figure out how to do this. This has to get done in this amount of time per cycle. And with that, I can complete the system. Second order, I don't know yet what I will need to know what to complete the system. That's where all of you are at with your projects right now. Uh, at, the, at the very best, you're at second order because you're all taking new projects. You don't know yet everything that you're going to need to know to complete the project. That's part of the discovery process you're going to be on. The third order is, I don't know how to discover what I need to know to complete the system. That's a lot of what this class is about. It is the software development process. And what you need to do, you're all going to be faced, I, you know, I have a, not even half complete, I have a, a tiny completed game, tiny portion completed game that I started working on a couple years ago. Uh, and you know, I've, I've done game design, I've been programming for 40 years and so on, and yet I can look at it and say, okay, there's a lot that I don't know to, to get this done. Uh, and there are things that I'm going to have to do and figure out what to do in order just to try and get it done. Fourth order is I have no clue about any of the issues involved, and again, you're going to run into people like that. So he has a uh, order of ignorance cycle, you're going to read it so you can talk about it. Basically, this is part of the iteration in software. You do some exploring. You, you, you say, okay, I want to work with voxels. Okay, I want to do something with voxels. Uh, that didn't work, but I now know more of what I'm going to do to learn how to make voxels work. And the next time through, it's like, oh, okay, well, this actually worked out better, but you know, I'm going to have to play around with this. So you have this, you're basically starting off at a third order of ignorant, and you're doing these explorations to narrow down to, to get to the point of a zero order of ignorance where you know what to do to accomplish each of these. By the way, this is one of the reasons, this is why Stack Overflow is so popular, and, and for, for a good 25 years, I've said the single most valuable thing to software engineering is finding working snippets of code. <laughs> because you're immediately leaping from this spot to right here. It's like, I can plug that working snippet of code in, and it works, and it does it. Okay, now I can step back and say, okay, now I want to make it do this, and you've just short-circuited a major aspect of the software development project. 
so, what do we need to do? We need to identify if there are areas where we have ignorance, what questions we need to ask to resolve those ignorance, and get the answers in the form that we can use. The problem is that as we learn more, we discover more that we don't know. I mean, that's, that's you know, you're sort of your classic, uh, the older I get, the less I know situation because you say, oh yeah, I know how to do X, Y, and Z, and then you start doing stuff that's like, well, there's a whole other body here of stuff I don't know. I mentioned that I've worked, I worked on at Airing on the Iridium satellite project. And they were doing the network management system. Now, this is not Ethernet network management. This is a whole other type of network management. ASN.1. I don't know if any of you had exposure to that sort of stuff. At that point, I had been programming for 20 years. I'd been out in industry. Uh, for over 15 years, and I literally had never heard of this stuff. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't coming upon me to code, but I was having to work with the engineers, the, the actual network engineers, as well as the developers. So what did I do? I went out and bought five books, which I still own, on this type of network management, and started reading, learning, learning about all this stuff. Uh, <clears throat> The, he, he, he says the problem is that, you know, first we, we learn how much we don't know as we learn. We don't have a way of empirically measuring knowledge. How much information is actually in a book? You know, can you, can you quantify that? Well, no, because it's in sort of a postmodernistic way, it's how much does the knowledge there vary from what you know or what you think you know. Uh, Claude Shannon's, one of his, the father of information theory, one of his famous theorems is that the value of information is inversely proportional to its probability. Uh, if I tell you the sun's going to rise tomorrow, that's not a very valuable piece of information. If I tell you the sun's not going to rise tomorrow, that's true, that's an extremely valuable piece of information. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and this last point here is a critical measure of knowledge in software is that of the knowledge not in software. This gets back to the whole issue of things that you have discovered that don't get implemented, but that sort of carve off all the areas where you don't have to explore because that's not where you're going to find a solution. And this is why, you know, for, for and we've hammered on this several times. When someone picks up a piece of software they haven't worked on, unless they have some grasp of all the knowledge that isn't in the software, of all the dead ends, of all the failed attempts, of all the things that didn't work, uh, they're going to introduce inefficiencies and possible defects in their attempt to modify this stuff. Any thoughts, experiences, relevant stuff? You're all looking tired. Stay with me. <laughs> okay. Absorbing so much knowledge. Yeah. Oh. And he has to stand on excuses. Just like us.